welcome everybody. Yeah, we'll get started. Just probably like one or two minutes after seven, Regina. Okay, no worries. So, okay. Yes, we got about six or seven minutes before we get started. So welcome okay. as, as you come in. Hello and welcome. We'll get started in a few minutes. If you have any questions, please be sure to leave them in the chat box and we will share them with the speaker. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Just a reminder, we can't see you or hear you. So please leave any messages, any questions in the chat box. And we'll get sorted in a few minutes. We're excited about this program. Don't give away all the secrets yet, Regina. <laughs> no, it's funny. You have to remember if you touch the Zoom, you can't get back to you've got to click back in your screen. I just oh, okay. get that, but yeah. I also would say, um, I don't know if anybody's on yet, but if they have any particular yeah. issues to raise them, obviously. Oh, no, Nicole.
So a lot of people got out to their gardens today, um, which is wonderful. Um, Arlene cleaned out some overgrowth. Um, Margo's on the alert for a red lily bug. Oh yeah. That is a new addition to my garden two years ago. I have not seen it yet this year, which I'm kind of surprised about. I yeah. don't know anything about a red lily bug, so. Yeah, um, it really likes the Asiatic lilies, not the day lilies. Um, and I noticed it a couple of years ago. And I don't think you'll be talking about squirrels today, but it looks like um, Michelle said that squirrels pulled out all her corn. So corn, corn yes. Wow. The squirrels are really a problem by you guys. I notice this is always the question I get at any of the programs I've done. The squirrels always the big number one problem. Yeah, and um, I, M Margaret is mentioning the voles, which I also deal with, and they ate her lily bulbs. They also ate my lilies as well, so oh. I can relate. The voles are out of control. Wow. Yeah, it's all about the balance of nature. I'm sure we don't have the predators that were at one point probably picking those guys off. Um, I will say this about possibly protecting your flowering bulbs by maybe planting garlic cloves with them because garlic tends to like not get eaten by anything. And it, it may distract them or throw them off the scent of your beautiful bulbs. As far as squirrels go, um, blood meal is always a good option. It kind of, I don't know what it is about it. They don't like the smell of it. It's, it's like, a, you know, it's like a murder scene to them probably. So they're, they're not, they're usually not interested. The only other caveat to that with the blood meal would be if you have a dog, <laughs> he's going to be, or he or she will be interested in the blood meal. So you'd have to keep your dog away from the blood meal. It'll keep the squirrels away, but it'll attract the dog. Okay, so, yeah. Regina, it's about three after. So it, we have a, a lot of people here. Okay, great. So if you want to get started and as we go along, feel free to ask, you know, write in your questions and I will do my best to convey them all to Regina and I am sure she'll have answers to a lot of them. Let's hope. Anyway, uh, well, welcome. My name is Regina Deluca Kensky. Um, I'm a librarian, a grower, um, a long lifelong organic, well, not lifelong, but I'm, uh, yeah, pretty much a lifelong organic grower, but more recently have learned much more about organic growing in the last 15 years. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about pest management and trying to identify what is a good bug versus a bad bug. And generally speaking, whenever I find a bug and I if I can't catch it, I have one of these handy little things, these nets, they're like a $2 at the dollar store. You can catch it, but I usually ask that bug first off, are you a good bug or a bad bug? I don't like to kill anything before I really know what it is because it's hard to tell just by the look of it, whether it's actually a, a, pre, you know, a pe beneficial insect or a detrimental one. So I'm gonna go through some concepts today. I have a lot of slides at the very end of different flowers you can grow. If we were in the library today, I would probably have those seeds to hand out to you. But since we're in this virtual environment, I'm gonna kind of go quickly through there. Um, I think this recording will probably be, remain on Middle Country Public Library's page. So you can always refer back to it. Um, and with that, I just wanna thank Middle Country Public Library for inviting me back for another virtual program. So without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So today we're going to talk about um, pest management and how it affects you, um, you, your health and how you manage them. We're going to talk about who those insects are. We're going to identify the beneficials versus the detrimentals. And we're going to talk about how to identify, control, and um, perhaps invite some beneficials and uh, that will take care of those negative insects. 
Um, so clearly using pesticides is, is gonna be the quickest way to get rid of an insect, but, oh my goodness, that did that all by itself. Um, but there are reasons we don't wanna do that. You know, there's health issues for you, for the other animals in the so in the, on the planet, as well as the, the, how the soil food web um, interacts. And um, insecticides are really not overall a good way to go. And you cannot use insecticides in organic gardening. Um, Okay, so, so I always like to start with this slide that talks a little bit about how insecticides work. So, um, so much easier to do this in person, but um, generally speaking, well, not generally speaking, but actually anything that we choose to do, say I'm going to pick up a pen, right? There are, there's a ner your nervous system lets you pass that message from your brain to your hand to pick up this pen. And the way that works is there are nerves all through your body. Um, the, the end of one nerve um, is an ax, has an axon at the end and the beginning of the next nerve has something called a dendrite. And the way that insecticides work, there's two ways. It's either that the, it, the insecticide uh, does, a, does some kind of a poisoning effect to the axon so that it can't pass the message or as you can see in this slide on the bottom, um, the message that's passed that sits within this, this like kind of channel between the dendrite and the axon, it usually gets cleared out by an enzyme. And synapse poisons actually turn that sig signal off to release that enzyme. And this is a very long named enzyme, acetylcholinesterase. Um, but that, that, why is that happening? I'm so sorry, this thing's got a mind of its own. Um, it doesn't clear the message. So what actually happens is there's a lot of writhing going on and that's what you usually see when you've just sprayed an insect with a can of rape. So what's important to know about this is we are actually, I'm so sorry, something is wonking out here. We are actually part of the same uh, group of, of in the same kingdom, which is a uh, part of taxonomy as insects and other animals out there. So the way um, a pesticide works on, on, on an insect is the same way it's gonna work on us. And that's something that they discovered pesticides really after World War II, when they were testing these mustard gases, they noticed that a huge amount of insect pest pressure was diminished because uh, when they sprayed people with it, they were also killing a lot of insects. So it is a, it's deadly to all of us. And so that's something to remember. So again, I just want to show you, we're in the kingdom Animalia. And, um, oh, I am so, I don't know why this is happening. It's just going, I'm not even touching it. Um, and insects are in there as, much, as well as the other ones. So um, we're multicellular and we're heterotrophs, which means we don't actually make our own food. And that's one of the common things about us. There are actually 20 common, 20 common traits of animals um, that we share with these other creatures in, in that kingdom. I'm not going to talk about them, but the most important part is this nervous system one. And this is the, the key way that insecticides work. They work on our nervous system. So in pest management, we have to first recognize that not all pests are, at all, not all insects are pests. Um, there are beneficial ones that play the role of pollinators. There are predators that actually predate on those insects that are a problem. And then they're also the, insects are also a food source for the soil web. I don't know why this is happening. I so apologize. I'm not touching a thing. Um, so my mantra is always try to identify an insect before killing it. And I don't know if you caught me in the beginning, but I have this little net. If I can't actually grab that thing and stick it in a little jar, or if I'm nearby, I can grab my net and grab it and go online and look things up. We also have this handy little device, the phone with the photograph feature. You can, you can take a picture and go later on and see if that insect is a problem. If it's a problem, try to refine it. And then if it is, you know, you can go ahead and dispatch it. So very basically the food soil web is a series of of levels of who eats who. And when we 
get rid of insects altogether, we're also screwing around with that web. Because as we know, birds will often eat insects. They really love a uh, caterpillar over a seed any day to feed their young when they're, when they're hatching and, and nesting their babies. Um, and, it, and it works right down into the soil system. And so it, they're really important in all kinds of functions in terms of um, recycling nutrients and uh, basically giving us food. So who's who of the beneficials? <sighs> Take a breath. Um, so we have pollinators and they um, will bring us both fruit and seed. And those of course include the butterflies, the bees, the um, moths, flies, and um, even insects that are generally predate, predation, pre predating insects, but in their different forms, they may also do pollination. Predators um, like lacewings, ladybugs, spiders, and hoverflies are exactly that. They will track down a detrimental insect and they will basically uh, eat it. Uh, yeah, basically eat it. That's really what it does. Um, parasitizers, like the technic fly and the Bracca wet wasp, they actually will lay their egg in their host, whatever insect that happens to be, and the eggs will develop and feed off of that host. It's like a, you know, a built-in buffet. So um, I just want to point out the one image on the upper right-hand side is actually in my garden. This is valerian I have in my garden. And a couple of years ago, I noticed this bee on my plant. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I looked a little closer and I realized it's not a bee. It's actually a hoverfly. It looks a lot like a, like a yellow jacket, wouldn't you say? And um, you might be tempted to swat it, but it's actually a really good insect for dealing with um, all kinds of soft-bodied insects. Uh, that are detrimental. On the lower left-hand side is something called a lacewing. That's the larva of a lacewing, and I'll talk about what a larva is further on. And it's actually eating an aphid. And speaking of aphids, this year I had never seen aphids before on one of my uh, beautiful shrubs out there. I have a mock orange that's actually finally blooming, and it was covered in aphids this year. So I'm not sure if we're going to have a little more pressure because of the winter being so mild. But um, that's something to keep an eye out for. And that's one of the things that you'll learn to do is to start scouting your garden. So spiders are, spiders are, are kind of creepy, but they really do a huge amount of beneficial stuff for us. They eat flies, beetles, moths, and other flying insects. The green lacewing, which is this insect on the left-hand side, um, is also known as the aphid lion. It will actually um, eat about 60 aphids per hour, which is phenomenal. And it has, eats other insects too that are not um, helpful to us. And it's, um, it looks like this on the right-hand side as an adult. So it might be tempting to think it's a bad bug, but it's not. And uh, it also does pollination as I mentioned earlier. Oh, I did it right that time. Uh, the ladybug, of course, um, everyone's familiar with this little beauty, um, they're phenomenal aphid eaters. They also eat thrips and mites and singe bugs, Colorado potato beetles and asparagus beetles. And um, if you have asparagus, this is the time to kind of look at it just as, a, as a, an aside. You want to take a look for it and I'll show you uh, pictures of what you're going to be looking for in a few slides. Um, but that can really destroy your, your um, your asparagus crop because it eats all of the leaves. And as we know, the leaves are what causes the plant to be able to feed itself. If, if the leaves aren't there, there's no photosynthesis and therefore the plant dies. So I just want you to pay attention to some of the differences in the way the insect looks as an adult versus as, an, as a larva. So on the left-hand side is the adult uh, ladybug. On the right-hand side is the um, is the actual larval stage. And that is the active feeding stage of any insect. And um, that's where they're gonna be doing the most damage if they're detrimentals, but they'll be doing the most benefit to you if they're beneficials, because they're usually eating all of those aphids, et cetera. And again, here on the bottom left, we see the hoverfly. And it's also, it's also great on, on those soft body pest insects. Praying mantises are a mixed bag. They eat both bad and good insects. And I don't know if anyone's ever seen this kind of um, 
gizmo on any of their plants in the fall, especially you'll see them once all the leaves have fallen off. Um, basically, that is the uh, chrysalis or it's, it's basically where all the little babies are forming. And if I'm ever cleaning up my garden and I see this, I, I never throw this away because these are really actually very good insects on the whole. I will just take that stick if I had cut it by mistake and I'll put it somewhere else where it can just continue to sit there until the spring when it'll all hatch. When, a, when praying mantises hatch, there's like thousands of them that come out of that little, um, that little um, chrysalis, I suppose. Um, and they will actually eat each other. So they fight to the end. So the top praying mantis wins. Um, on the lower right, lower left-hand side is a minute pirate bug. bug. They're really great for controlling aphids, caterpillars, and they're really handy in a greenhouse because they really like humidity. So these are insects that you may or may not know about. The minute pair bug is tiny. If you know the size of an aphid, which is what is on that leaf, this thing is not much bigger. So something to consider. Size, size is not an indication of whether it's good or bad or how it's working, but um, it's a really great insect to have around if you can. And I have images of flowers and things you can plant that will attract those, those um, minute pirate bugs. Spine soldier bug, um, you might think this is a sink bug. There are differences. This is not a great image for you to be able to see up close probably. Um, maybe when you, if you revisit this slide, you can take a better look, but there are differences that tell you the difference between a spine soldier bug, which is a really handy uh, predator. It eats hornworms, which is a gigantic, caterpillar who will really just devour your entire garden if you give it half a chance. Um, and on the right hand side is the um, is a stink bug, but even stink bugs have some benefits to them. Oh wait, is it a spine soldier bug and a, I can barely see that, I apologize. It might be a, a squash bug actually. Um, this trichogramma wasp is really teeny tiny. Those are actually, um, those are actually the, the eggs, I think, of something very small, <laughs> that they're even smaller than that. So, but they, they actually are parasites. So that's what I was saying before. They'll lay their eggs inside that larva and it'll just eat it from the inside out. Ground beetles. Now these guys look really creepy, but um, they're really, really phenomenal. They eat all kinds of insects, they eat maggots, aphids. Uh, caterpillars, wireworms. And wireworms are the worm that if you ever grew carrots and you pull your beautiful carrot from the ground, you're waiting to see the perfect carrot. You see all these holes in it and ridges around it. That's the wireworm. Um, these guys take care of them. One of the things that people tend to do on law, um, even as an organic control for slugs is they put something down called sluggo. Well, sluggo is actually detrimental to them. So um, some organically based insecticides are kind of what we call broad spectrum, which means they don't really specify to the correct insect, they'll kill everything. So um, if you see these guys and you know they're kind of creepy, let them go. They're really great to have in your garden. The assassin bug on the left-hand side on the bottom, they feed a wide, from a wide range of pests, um, so they're good to have. So uh, before I go on to the detrimentals, I wanna talk a little bit about why we need pollinators. It's not just about flowers and seeds, but if you look at this screen here, you'll see that there are so many fruits, vegetables, seeds, and nuts that will not be in our diet without pollinators. So it's really, really important to consider don't know why that did that, uh, to consider uh, how important it is not to be killing insects that could be pollinators as well. Um, on the bottom right-hand side, you can see uh, that's actually a bee pollinating, I think a squash or a cucumber flower. But really, really important to know that. And, and pollinators come in all shapes and sizes. They're not always uh, bumblebees and not always butterflies. So you really need to familiarize yourself. So in pest management, you really want to know uh, what these insects look like at the different stages of their life. Um, an egg is, is the easiest uh, stage in which to control an insect. Of course, you don't want to be crushing uh, 
beneficial eggs. So you kind of might need to identify those before you do that. And that's how you would control a, a, a detrimental insect is by crushing the eggs on the leaves. Generally speaking, the leaves show up, the leaf, the eggs are on the underside of a leaf um, because that's the safest place for it to be uh, as far as uh, uh, an egg goes. Um, the larval stage is usually a caterpillar, right? Like a, or it looks like an insect with legs um, that crawls around. Those are, that's the stage, it's like the teenage stage, that's the active feeding stage, right? So they're gonna be doing the most feeding, whether if it's a detrimental bug, it's probably gonna be feeding on your plants. If it's, an, if it's a beneficial, it'll probably be feeding on a detrimental. So you kinda of wanna know what something looks like through its different stages. And this happens to be something called a tachnip fly, I talked about it a little earlier. And this is the, um, the adult is on the upper left-hand side. The eggs are laid into that cabbage looper, which is, it's a parasite, parasitizing insect. The, um, the pupae of the adult fly is on the upper right there. And then the larva of the adult tachnic fly, of, I mean, of the tachnic fly is on the lower right. So you need to kind of know the difference between the larval stages too. And then the adult stage um, is the reproductive stage. That's the stage at which these insects are generally flying around, um, having all kinds of fun and laying eggs. Um, and the way you know an insect is an adult is only insects that are, only adults will ever have wings. So you'll know by looking at it to see if it flies, it's definitely an adult. So when you know the different stages, you're gonna be able to be able to hopefully identify and know whether or not you have a problem or, or a positive situation on your hands. So what I always say is look it up, go online. There's some great resources I'm gonna share with you today. And you're going to work with nature and you will get further ahead than just spraying a bottle of Ray or whatever it is. So in pest management, we, in organic gardening, we like to destroy the bad and invite the good. We do that by offering companion plantings, which might have um, some effect of uh, maybe distracting an insect from another, uh, from an insect or a pest, like, a, like you were talking about the voles before. Companion plantings may distract that particular uh, problem insect from attacking your, your plant because it's confused. Because these plants send off all kinds of colors and uh, all kinds of sense that we just can't even begin to um, sense, sense. So um, that's one of the reasons you do companion plantings. Um, you can rotate plantings to make sure that you're not constantly planting the same thing in the same place because a lot of insects will actually overwinter in the ground below the roots of the plant that they really like to eat the most. So you're almost setting up a perfect instant buffet for them by not rotating. And then scouting. Scouting is simply going out and looking at your plants. You know, I know we a lot of us have um, irrigation systems that just take care of the watering, so we don't need to actually walk up to our plants and look at them and and get get close and personal with them. But um, that's the one way you're really going to see if there's any damage happening to your plants is by scouting. And that's something you really need to do right now because as the days get warmer more insects are emerging and they all have a certain, um, they all have a certain time of the year when they come out depending on how warm it's been. And it's been super warm the last couple of days, but it has to be a consistent number of days. Uh, they call them growing degree days. And there are resources out there to get alerts as to what the growing degree days are from the county. Um, and they, then you can kind of tie back and say, okay, if it's, you know, 64 growing to deep three days today, I should start looking for this particular insect. So as I said before, we have good insects. Um, and I was telling you before about this parasitic wasp and I was telling you how it's a parasite. And here's a good example. On the left-hand side is an image of a tomato hornworm, which is a very fat worm. It's got a thickness of your thumb and it will actually just devour your garden in no time flat. And uh, I learned this the hard way one year um, when I was gardening up in Eaton's Neck and I had timers set up and sprinklers set up and everything was automatic and I only had to go through a couple of days. And the day I went up and I saw all of my tomato plants defoliated and all of my pepper plants defoliated. And then I found the culprit and it was this big tomato hornworm. So scouting. Um, 
You're gonna check the undersides of the leaves. You're gonna note the condition of the plant if there are chewed leaves. You're gonna do it in the morning and the evening because some insects come out at night, some insects come out in the morning. Um, signs you have an insect pest is chewed leaves. And I have a, an example here. Um, brown droppings of some sort, that's usually the worm poop. I mean, if you ever had grown cabbage or broccoli and suddenly you see all these black, little black round things on your plants or on the stems or, or, or towards the base of the plant, you'll know you have a, 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 a caterpillar on there and they are very, very, I mean, super sleuthy. I mean, you cannot find them. You have to look very closely and sometimes you'll see them actually on the on the main vein of the plant and they, they, they blend in so beautifully you would never notice. But you know you have a problem when you see that poop. Um, frass, which is uh, this on the bottom hand, right hand side, you'll see that's frass from a squash borer. Frass is basically insect debris. It's um, basically, again, it could be, it could be poop, but it, in this case, it's probably more like the inside of the plant being kind of pushed out as the borer goes in. And if you have wilted leaves, now wilted leaves can be a number of things. It could be watering too much. It could be watering too little. Um, but it's really probably also could be a, the sign of a plant that's been gutted. Because remember, all of the vascular system of a plant is within that stem. And if, if nutrients can't go up and down and water can't travel through the stem of that plant, the leaves are going to wilt. The plant's going to try to shut down that production of water or it won't be, even be able to get the water up there. So I'm going to try to see if I can show you this picture. Um, this is an eggplant. I'm an organic grower of transplants. And a couple of days ago, I noticed my eggplants were getting rife with this, holes in it. And I thought beetle, right? I thought, ugh, Japanese beetles. That's what it's got to be. But I noticed in, uh, I picked up a, a tray the other day and I looked underneath and I noticed these little slugs. I mean, they're not the big slugs. They're like little pink slugs. Uh, and I should have caught one and actually brought it in so you could have seen it. But that is what's doing the damage. And they will just, again, when you have this, this is interfering with the, with the photosynthesis of your plants. So what do you do? Slugs are uh, not on my slice thing today, but uh, somebody mentioned earlier, if you crush up some eggshells and put them around your plants, that might help a little bit. Uh, sand works well. Uh, diatomaceous earth works well. Charcoal grit. If you have a barbecue, you can put some of that down, but be careful with that because that might change the pH of your soil. And what the reason is for that is because slugs are very soft. They're soft and slimy and they don't like crawling over anything sharp. And believe it or not, the sand would be considered sharp. Uh, the eggshells are certainly sharp. So they're, they're not going to really cross over a, a line of anything that's too gritty. Okay, so pest management. We want to destroy the bad and deter, and deter them. And you can uh, take up this as a, as a hobby if you'd like, but um, we're not there yet. Uh, you can hand pick them off your plants, um, drop them in some soapy water. The soapy water, uh, just a drop of soap, of dish soap in a container of water will prevent the insect from flying out because it creates surface tension, which keeps the insect from being able to fly out. So you can get rid of it that way. You can squish them, which is a technical term <laughs> for dispatching this little, uh, these, these insects. Uh, high pressure water spray. So if you have aphids, like I had aphids on my mock orange the other day and I got out there with my hose and as much water pressure as I have, which isn't great. I, I kind of sprayed a lot of them off. But you know, it's interesting. I noticed, and I, I should have included a photograph today, but I noticed there were ladybugs on there too. So then I said, okay, I'm going to stop and let the ladybugs take over. I got a lot of them off. I cut off any stems that were really covered in those um, aphids and I threw them in the garbage. And, uh, but the high water pressure water spray will really do a great, great job in getting rid of some of these soft bodied insects. Insecticidal soap, or just a little, again, a little soap in a, in a spray bottle will kind of suffocate a soft bodied insect because their, their whole respiratory system is, um, it's, it's external and it's not, it's not very evolved. So a soapy water will, will kind of do them in. And then you want to create an inhospitable environment. And how do you do that? Well, the eggshells, the sand, the uh, maybe a maybe a, another uh, something else you can put out there. Some people like swear by the pepper spray. And some guy yesterday was telling me about this 
rotten egg smelly thing that he puts on his plants and you could try all of those things but you know it's sometimes it's trial and error because um not every insect responds the same way pest management and you can invite the good right so uh, what you want to do is you want to invite them by planting a habitat that's going to bring the beneficials over. So there are many plants out there. This is a quick little list, but bee balm will bring the hoverfly predatory wasps, parsley, and in fact, any of those flat, those herbs that make that umbrella kind of flower at the top, they're terrific for pollinators, as well as for um, predators and, um, and probably also parasitizers. Um, sunflowers are an incredible um, resource and they're so easy to grow. And then buckwheat, if you're doing a cover crop, will invite parasitic wests and lady beetles. You can um, do companion plantings, like I said before. So um, some people believe that if you plant two different plants together, it kind of distracts and confuses the insect. So it won't really come to your garden and attack it. One of the things that I did learn that year that I gardened up in old in Eaton's neck and I had that tomato hornworm is I did not actually plant basil or marigolds next to my tomatoes. I always thought that was just like a little old wives tale, but sometimes these things that perpetuate in society as, as stories sometimes have some truth. So um, I think this is definitely uh, probably a pretty valid one. And this cat's not doing a darn thing. He's just having a good day. Uh, rotate your plantings. And again, you're gonna overwinter by overwintering, by insects that go into the ground and overwinter in the spot where you had something last year, you're not going to give them a ready to, ready to eat buffet the minute their young climb back up and start eating. Um, insects will tend to lay their eggs where they think that there'll be a good place for their, their offspring to uh, thrive and survive by eating things. So if you move the plant to a different place, that plant won't be there. And again, there are soil borne diseases and nutrient deficiencies that you can avoid by rotating your plantings. So um, that's the other thing you want to consider. When you stress your plant, just like us, if we get stressed, we get sick. I don't have any times I've like had a crazy couple of weeks and I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, and I'm, I'm just about done. And then I get all of it done and then boom, I get a cold. Same thing with plants. Plants that are stressed are going to be sending out these distress signals, signals or there's, a, there's something that they emit that lets insects know there's a problem. So make sure your plants are well watered. Don't let them get drought stressed. Make sure they have enough sunlight, enough airflow, so that they're not in a place where they're fighting to survive because the week will go, right? And the insects will find them. And I don't know if anyone's ever had a situation with kale, but I noticed the years when I planted my kale and kind of didn't water it as much as I should have, or maybe it was in the bright, bright sun all day. It likes a little shade. It will actually do very well in a little shade. Those are the ones that got the white flies and those white flies are just disgusting. They fly off the minute you harvest your plants and you got to try to get rid of them and it's kind of gross. Um, so who's who of the detrimental? So top of the list here is that tomato hornworm and you'll see in that image how big that thing is. Look at that man's hand or a woman's hand. I'm, it's a man's hand um, and look how big that is in comparison to that hand they're gigantic and you can see the damage they've done on this tomato plant or this pepper plant it looks like um, but they really are voracious voracious eaters so you need to keep an eye out for those if you see your plants getting defoliated you have to find this guy he won't be hard to find and then you'll have to um, I don't know try to find a bird that will want to take a big fat worm off your hands um, the squash vine borer, we've all had issues with that. Oh, I forgot my, um, I had it. Let me see if I can find it before I go. Um, you, the, the best way to deal with them is really just by doing an exclusion uh, kind of row cover over those. Cucumber beetle, Mexican bean beetle, Colorado beetle, flea beetle, asparagus beetle, and aphids. And the lily beetle, I would say, is really similar looking to the Colorado potato beetle. So if you have that issue every year, this is what you're gonna to wanna to look for. When we get to the potato beetle um, larva, you'll see what you're, I'm talking about. So um, I'm not gonna go through too much detail with this, but because I don't wanna overwhelm you, but the tomato hornworm is actually a moth. It's the larva of a moth. Remember we talked before about the different stages of these insects. This is a great example of how insects 
actually develop. So they start with eggs, they go to something called an instar, which is basically like a stage of development. And they have several of these. And in the fifth instar is when it looks like that gigantic larva. There's the pupa, which is basically the chrysalis. If you find something like that, it could be a good moth, it could be a bad moth. I wouldn't necessarily kill that, but the adult is what that looks like. Um, the other thing I wanted to note about this was um, some insects, and then you can see here, it's, it's 19 to 23 days. There's a whole range here of time frame. Some insects have more than one life, one, one period of reproduction. So there are some insects that will be with us from May right to October. So just because you see them now doesn't mean you won't see them again next month. And they do reproduce pretty quickly. Um, the squash vine borer, this is that one that really does your zucchini in. You might think that you're not watering your zucchini enough. You might think uh, it's drought stress. And it basically what happens is this moth lays its egg in the very tender stem of your zucchini plants. And it has something called an ovipositor. So it's like, a, it's like a stabbing thing that goes into the stem. If it's very tender, it's easy to get it in there. And it lays its egg in there. And on the inside stem of that plant develops this larva. And this larva is going to just chew its way through your plant. It's, and then it'll bore its way out, probably become a pupa, and then it'll hatch and become this, this moth again. Your best bet for this is to use exclusion. And exclusion would include I thought I had uh, a little row cover here and I don't, I apologize. I don't. Okay. Um, it, it, we have something called row cover and it's, it's great for keeping these guys out because they do tend to come out at night. So they're going to lay their egg in your, in your vegetables at night. When you plant your zucchini, you put this very light row cover over it and uh, you leave it on that plant for until it's like pushing up against it and flowering. And then you take it off. And by then what's happened is the stem is lignified. And lignified is simply a way of saying that it's become more woody. So if it's more woody, that ovipositor can't go into that stem and they can't lay the egg in there. And then you get zucchini, more zucchini probably than you'll ever, ever want. So um, that's the way to really deal with it. You can also set out more mature plants. So don't put, if you start your own zucchini plants, keep them covered in their cell packs until it's time to plant them where they're a little bit stronger and they're not so tender. Your final choice on this is the Hail Mary Pass, is to dig out the larva and, and bury the stalk. Um, cross your fingers, cross your legs, cross your toes, cross everything because uh, I never had any success with this. But um, you can try it if you're really desperate to keep that zucchini. But remember, zucchini doesn't have to be planted once. You can plant it several times for the season. You could probably plant zucchini right up until the end of July and still get zucchini. You may not get bu bucket loads of it, but you will still get it. So uh, if you have a problem like this, it's probably better to yank it out and start again. Cucumber beetle. Um, this is a pretty, this cucumber beetle likes everything really. It likes pumpkins, melons, squash, and gourds. Um, it's active from May to September. It overwinters the ground, it does root feeding, and it also spreads a virus called mosaic virus. So again, your controls can be row cover, delay planting, planting resistant varieties of squash or cucumbers, and uh, keep an eye out for them and catch them, drop them, and they're fast. So what, what I like to do with cucumber beetles is I will hold a bucket of soapy water underneath a leaf and I'll tap it. They'll drop into that water and they won't get back out. And you can see here on the bottom right hand side, left hand side, I should say, is the life cycle of that, what, what these things look like as they get go through their different stages of development. Mexican bean beetle is, happens to be one of the worst insects we have here in where I live. And they're nonstop. Uh, they go all over everything, beans, squash, cucumbers, et cetera. They chew the leaves. Um, they show up now and they're, through the whole summer and they overwinter in the ground. Uh, your best control is to squish the eggs and that would mean go underneath the leaves, look under the leaves and squish them. That's your easiest way to catch them. You can squish the larva, which look like little tribbles. It's far grosser, uh, but it's still another way to go. Uh, we have found here that if you plant a little later, um, you're gonna have less trouble. Maybe you'll miss kind of like a, 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 a period of their production, reproduction. 
and pole beans tend to be more resistant than uh, bush beans. And pole beans are actually, I'm gonna put a plug in for pole beans now. Uh, pole beans just take a little more work and that you have to put a, a structure up, but they, they are really great to, in, for two ways. First, they're more forgiving. Uh, you don't have to pick them every day to keep them coming. Um, and they will produce all season, right up until frost. So they're far more productive. They're forgiving and that you don't have to pick them every day. And um, that's pretty much it. And they are resistant to the pole, to the uh, Mexican bean beetle as well. So um, that would be my suggestion. If you, if you grow bush beans, uh, try pole beans if you have an issue with this Mexican bean beetle. The Colorado potato beetle. So this is the one I was telling you before, reminding me a lot of the lily beetle. It's a little red lily beetle. And the red lily beetles just looks like a, a little beetle that's slender and red. And it's, it likes the Asiatic lilies. It doesn't care about the day lilies, probably because they're not you know, so fancy schmancy, but they will start showing up um, probably soon. I'm gonna say in a week or so, and then uh, you'll know, you'll see these blobby little larvae on your plants. In fact, I had these on my lilies a couple of years ago when I thought, oh my God, Colorado potato beetle, what's it doing here? As time went on, I got as many as I could off, but eventually I saw the adult and it was a lily, be lily beetle, and I've never seen that before. So I'm gonna guess we're gonna have them again this year, especially with the mild winter, because there's not a lot of, um, uh, the winter just definitely calls a lot of the bad stuff out. So again, your control is crush the eggs, pick the larva, ladybugs, stink bugs, brand the beetle eggs and the larva, so invite those into your garden. The flea beetle, I wish I had a better option than- Regina, yes. Margo said she had her first red lily beetle on April 16th this year. So wow, well, really, it was warm. Early, really early. Wow, that is, it's an early lily beetle. Um, well, it was very warm in April. In fact, I would argue that it was warmer in April than it was in May. <laughs> so it's entirely possible that that warmth of the winter didn't, you know, it kind of didn't do them in so fast. And that really nice warm weather we had in April probably brought them out sooner. Uh, I haven't seen any yet this year. So maybe I did a good job in getting rid of them. I don't know. But um, keep an eye out. I, there's not very much you can do except to pick them off and make sure you get the adults. And then, you know, hopefully you, you, you kind of put a stop to the reproduction. The flea beetle, um, you've probably seen this on your plants. Maybe you didn't know what it was. Maybe you thought it was sun's fault, but it's, uh, it's actually the flea beetle. It does like this shotgun kind of damage. It's, uh, it feeds on the leaves, which of course affects the photosynthesis, which of course forgets the, will affect the, um, the production of the plants if it doesn't outright kill it. And it's really on anything, anything and everything. And I don't yet, I haven't yet cracked the code on what really makes makes some plants more attractive than others at certain times of the year, except to think that I think if it's a little drier out and you're not really keeping your plants well irrigated, um, then you're going to find that the, they're gonna be there more. They really like younger plants. So if you can put a larger plant out, they really love it. They really love eggplant, love it, love it, love it, love it. Um, so if you put out a young, tender little baby eggplant and it's, it's, they're just gonna love that nice, sweet, uh, young flesh and they will, uh, they'll destroy it. And sometimes you can uh, try these other tricks. Like I tried one year putting cotton balls out with a, you know, citronella oil on them. There's this theory that the, uh, the flea beetle won't uh, land on the plant if it, if it can't see the shadow of the plant on the ground. So you can try putting a collar around the plant, which might throw the shadow off the ground. You know, it's, it's just one of these things. I, I remember somebody telling me a few years ago, um, they had neighbors next door, they were Indian from India, and uh, they'd see them go out into the garden every year. And I, you can't see me doing this because I'm not in the room with you, but they would go out and they see them walking through their plants and kind of waving their arms through their plants. And every day they do it several times a day. And one day somebody said, what are you, what are you doing? And they're like, oh, we're getting the flea beetles off because they disturb them. Every time you touch them, they pop off and they really do look like fleas. They're teeny, 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 tiny. This is not, this looks gigantic compared to what it looks like. It's like a little black dot. So um, if you're seeing this kind of damage, you have a flea beetle problem, 
that's really all you can do is just keep disturbing them and hopefully, you know, they get bothered enough not to come back, or at least you're you're putting a little break to their their munching system, their munching uh, their munching uh, opportunities. The asparagus beetle. We just talked about this a little while ago. So the asparagus beetle is loves asparagus, uh, and it really is the only thing it loves, which is always very aptly named. Um, and basically, what you're going to look for on your asparagus, and I would look right now is for these eggs on the upper um, upper left-hand side photograph. You're gonna see that person's holding the stem of an asparagus. You know, when asparagus comes up, it's very, very thin. Uh, and well, it's, it's, it's a very smooth stem. Perpendicular to that stem, you're going to see these eggs. And you see these little black eggs. You might not think it's anything, but those are actually the eggs of the asparagus beetle. They're easy to get off, squash them off, right? Just slide your hand up there and get rid of them. The next stage for the asparagus beetle is this larva that's in the lower left-hand side. It is disgusting. And they, what they do is, and if you know what asparagus looks like, how it's very ferny, like there's the, on the right-hand side there, you see the, the crown of the asparagus. That, that's what becomes ferny. If you don't pick them and you don't pick all your asparagus clearly, if it's not large enough, you, you kind of leave some, but you don't want these guys munching on that because that's your growth for next year. Um, but they'll just defoliate the plant and you'll see these disgusting gray, gross things. The lady, the, the, the um, asparagus beetle, which looks a lot like the lady beetle, except the lady beetle doesn't have any of these black and white uh, features to them. Super fast super fast bugs. You cannot catch them. You could not grab one to squish one if your life depended on it. So once again, I go with this, this bucket of water thing, tap it, and they kind of do this, uh, this um, defensive drop to the ground thing, and then they go into the ground. But if you have a bucket of water under there with soap in it, they're in the bucket and you're done. So uh, this is something that uh, if you grow asparagus, you really have to keep an eye on because they will over time weaken your plant. You know, If they're eating all the foliage off, Everyone knows that the foliage on the asparagus, if you're not eating a spear, and this is why you only cut asparagus occasionally, you don't cut every single spear all season. You only cut for a certain period of time and let the rest of it go up to flush green, ferny growth. Because that ferny growth is taking energy from the sun and it's putting it down into the root system, which you know is like a fibrous kind of uh, spider-like kind of tuber, not a tuber, uh, like a rhizome, I suppose. So that energy is stored till next year when it sends back up a new shoot, those nice new shoots of asparagus in the spring. The aphids, um, they like everything. And aphids, uh, I learned this in entomology, they have an incredible life cycle. They just do some crazy things that you wouldn't even believe. And they turn from males to females and females to males, and they are just indestructible. So they like just about everything. Uh, bean, they really like peas and beans. Anything that you've really given too much fertilizer to, because they like that nice, lushy growth. Um, you'll see this, this word, M long cucumber. I don't know what that is. I just have to figure out what it is. I'm not taking it out until I know what it is, but it was something. So I left it there because I don't know what that is. Is it, is it a type of cucumber? Is it some other word that was supposed to be with the cucumber? But I'm leaving it there. Just know they like everything, um, even M long cucumbers, whatever those are. Um, they are usually available for uh, eating all your good stuff from spring through uh, the growing season. And a strong spray of water really works, lady beetles work. Um, avoid over fertilization, because as I said, they really like that fresh, fresh, nice, lush growth. Um, if you are of the mind to go out and buy lady beetles, to control these, um, just know, generally speaking, nature will take care of things on its own. And lady beetles are not gonna stick around if they don't have enough to eat. So try not to waste your money. You know, um, there's a lot of people out there who will sell you every insect under the sun to come take care of whatever problem you have, but your problem may be very small according to that insect you just spent a lot of money on. So um, <clears throat> generally speaking, I think if you can manage it by hosing things off or picking things off, if you have a really big problem, certainly go ahead and buy those um, biologicals that will take care of these things from a natural perspective. But you know, just take the long view if you can and give it a little time because it, if there aren't enough aphids for a ladybug uh, larva to eat, the ladybug's not gonna lay its egg there. It's just gonna fly off somewhere else and do it. 
So this is a really great book I like to point out to people, uh, Attracting Native Pollinators. I don't think it's online, so we'll have to wait for the libraries to open again, but you can certainly try. You can actually probably order it from the Xerxes Society if you are so inclined. It is a great organization. Xerxes Society is basically an organization that um, promotes the, uh, the benefits and um, helps to preserve natural habitats for any kind of um, insects that are beneficial. And there's a link there you can check out too. So I said I would go through this quickly because it is 750. But these are the different flowers you can grow that will help you um, deal with some of these insect pests. This screen is actually got multiple things going on with it. I talk about what it attracts. I talk about what are the things they can do. Most of these things are either edible or cuttable, but they're certainly all for beneficial. So calendula, it's a wonderful, wonderful plant, easy to grow, easy to save seeds from. One of the best things you can save seeds from and, the, and you'll get a lot of seeds. Um, Oh, this slide went in the wrong place. That's actually a tithonia. Um, bachelor buttons are really wonderful. Um, again, they attract all of these different insects. Um, again, cut flowers and edible flowers for those. You can throw those in your salad and wow all your friends if you ever get to see them again. Um, they, I have some companion plantings on these slides. So I'm hoping this, this presentation will be available so you can take a look. I can even give um, Amber a PDF of it if that's helpful to anybody. Cosmos, bright lights. This is not your yes. YouTube. I'm sorry. Yeah, it'll be on our YouTube station, um, mcpl.tv. So it it will be up if anyone needs to refer to it. Sure. And if anyone wants the PDF, um, definitely you can email me and I'll get that for you. Great, terrific. So the Cosmos is um, a different Cosmos than the Bipinitus. This is Cosmos sulfurous. It's very pretty. It's a great pollinator plant. Uh, praying mantis, and, and I remember I had said before how teeny tiny the little praying mantises are. There's a picture there that shows you how tiny they are when they hatch. Again, cut flowers, edible flowers, really beautiful plant. Verbena, it's great for bumblebees, butterflies, etc. You know, this slide will tell you all of it. Uh, signet marigolds are great for uh, minute parrot gloves and wasps and butterflies. Also companion plants, broccoli, basil, cucumbers, oh, just about everything there. And edible flowers. The sun, uh, the Mexican sunflower, which is really an amazing plant. It, it's really not something that you see around very much. Very easy to grow. Very tolerant of some part shade, I think, because um, I've grown it there. And um, it's, it's really a beautiful flower and it's great for cutting. And it's, it's just nothing like that in September. It's usually blooming right through frost. So it's really worth seeing. And usually you'll find bumblebees land on it at night and go to sleep on that little button in the middle. And it's really adorable. <laughs> uh, nasturtium, edible, um, really beautiful. Sunflower, as I mentioned before, is great for those um, big eyed bugs and the minute pirate bugs. and numerous other parasitoids. Edible for birds and people. It's a great pollen, pollen source. And uh, of course, um, cut flowers. So in addition to those flowers, there are these, fla these plants that will flower. Everything goes to a flower eventually if they're going to set seed. Basil's great. If, you see, if your basil's going to seed and you're like, oh, shoot, it's going to seed, it's done, just leave it, let it go. Basil, fennel, coriander, which is your cilantro, <laughs> let it go to seed. The benefits of leaving your coriander is it'll probably seed in and you'll get cilantro next year. Coriander is actually the seed. Cilantro is the leaf. Um, dill, garlic, chives, parsley, anything with that kind of... Um, Umbrella kind of shaped flower at the top are great for pollinators. Uh, the Eastern Swallowtail, which is on the upper right hand side there, if they find your parsley, and you'll notice your parsley is like getting devastated, it's the Eastern Swallowtail butterfly. And so it, it's, I think it's worth losing a couple of parsley plants too. So this is, these are great other options in addition to those flowers. So here are a couple of resources you can use to, um, figure out what you have that you're dealing with. Uh, I do not recommend just going onto Google and typing in red lily beetle because people put pictures up that are always wrong. I mean, there's some people that know what they're doing. 
Other sources you can use that are not here would be anything that has an extension, uh, if it's cooperative extension, or if it's an entomology department, it usually has a .edu uh, extension on the end of the URL, which is the, the address, the web address. Um, and that's pretty much it. So if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I hope I didn't go too fast. Yeah, Regina, that was really great. I have many pages of notes that I was taken down. So I learned great. a lot. So um, we have, have a few minutes for questions. If anyone has anything, type it in. Um, Regina, if you want to take a look at the chat box as well, that's at the bottom of your screen. Um, but everyone is thanking you for 